Above that, you're going to see a non-cross-browser compliant way of creating a request object. And by that I mean um, different browsers have different ways of creating the XML HTTP request object. This is a way that I'm showing that would work in a modern um, Firefox type browser. So what I'm doing first is I'm creating the URL of where I want to send that request to. Then I create an XML HTTP request object simply by creating that specific object by name. And once I have the request object, there's three things I'm going to do. First, I'm going to open it, which is more or less initializing it. So I set the first parameter is going to be my HTTP method. The two most common methods are get and post. In this case, I'm going to do a get so that I retrieve a particular resource. I pass in as a second parameter the URL for the resource I want to receive. And the third parameter is a Boolean. It's either true or false. And note that it's not uh, placed inside of quotes. Uh, true means this is an asynchronous request. And obviously, if we're doing AJAX, we probably want it to be asynchronous. So for the most part, you'll always write true. If for some reason you want to block, if you want it to be a uh, synchronous request and that can't move on until that response comes back, then you'd want to set that third parameter to be false. Third type of state that we want to change, the third property that we want to change on a request object is to register the name of that callback function we created below. And you do that by setting a property called onReadyStateChange and you pass in the name of that callback function. Finally, we call send on the request. You'll notice that the parameter is null in this case. That's simply because we're doing a GET request. And if you know a little bit about HTTP request objects, a GET request won't have anything in the body. All of the parameters that may be sent with a GET request will be included in the URL as part of the query string. And the query string is denoted in a URL uh, by the question mark, followed by name value pairs. So that's just a quick review of what it looks like to create our callback function and how to create an XML HTTP request object and send it off. So the benefits. Why do we want to use AJAX? Lots of benefits, really. Uh, first of all, we're able to create our request and wait for a response without interrupting additional activity on the web page. In a traditional web page, if I was to say, click on a link and start to type into a form on that page, eventually when the response came back, anything I was doing uh, on that web page, writing in the form, will be lost because the response will come back with an entire new HTML web page, rewriting everything that I've been working on. Uh, so Ajax allows us to just focus on a particular element of the web page while I continue to work. It's also going to be typically a, a much faster response, and this is mainly because of reduced page processing and reduced network traffic. So page processing, if I send a request to the server for a stock ticker update, um, in the traditional way, perhaps what I'd have to do is not only get that stock information, but also have it redraw the entire web page, generate all of that markup um, that would be sent back to the browser and used to redraw the page. So that's a lot more page processing on the server. If all I really need is just a little bit of information, just say the updated stock price, that's going to be a lot less work for the server to do. And of course, if um, there's uh, fewer bits of data being sent across the wire, that will also reduce our network traffic. So we're minimizing redundancy. Only the pieces that need to be updated are manipulated once that comes back. And typically just the information for a given widget is returned rather than all the redundant markup that we're not changing anyway. AJAX enabled widgets can be found all over the web. And one of the most typical types of widgets I see when using the web is involving a search box. You probably have seen this too. You go to some web page, they have a search box, and you start to type in what it is you're looking for. As you're typing, you start to see suggestions appear below of what the server maybe thinks that you're trying to find. Uh, this can be seen in something as common as the Google search engine. So for example, let's say I'm trying to find information on a band. So Google, I uh, load up the Google web page and I start to type in uh, Camper Van Beethoven, looking for some information about their music. So as I start to type, you'll notice that as I'm typing, 
um, different results are coming back that are getting more and more specific based on the letters that I've entered. And there, just by typing five letters, C-A-M-P-E, I can see down here that Camper Van Beethoven is one of the choices. And in this case, it happens to also tell me how many results we'll find. So I could click on that, and that would bring me to uh, the search results of Camper Van Beethoven. So that's an example of an AJAX-enabled widget. What was happening was that the entire web page wasn't refreshing every time I hit a key, but it was, in fact, sending a request and sent, getting some information and then redrawing a very specific portion of the web page based on that response without interrupting any other part of the web page. That's a very, very typical example of an AJAX-enabled widget. So the benefits seem pretty obvious for having asynchronous requests. What are some of the challenges? One of the primary challenges of coding AJAX by hand is involving the various browsers that you want to support. Unfortunately, uh, most of the browsers have lots and lots of different variations. This can be um, from the beginning in terms of creating the HTTP request object all the way um, to handling events and other different types of problems and uh, you know just differences and variances in JavaScript. So here's an example of a you know a real simple example of some of these variances. You can imagine that I want to support uh, some of the modern browsers, some uh, like new Firefox, but I also want to support older uh, IE browsers. In that case, I'd have to try to create my XML HTTP requests in several different ways. In the code example that you're seeing right now, um, what I first try to do is create the XML HTTP request object, and if it's there, great. If not, an exception will be thrown. I catch that. And then I try to create a different kind of object. This time I'll create an ActiveX object with a parameter um, that contains the name of the ActiveX object I'm trying to find. If that fails, then I can try even a different X, ActiveX object, and so on and so on. This is just a real simple example um, of the types of variations that happen between browsers. So when you're coding by hand, that means you need to be thinking about this, like what browsers am I supporting and where, how could this vary? In those cases, you start to branch your logic, as you see here. Some other challenges with AJAX have to do with breaking the back button. Now, there are some programmatic ways that you can get around this, but they're involved, and they take consideration and um, active uh, attention to this issue. And what I mean by breaking the back button is you can imagine you're on a web page and you're in some sort of widget that's perhaps a wizard, different stages, different steps. And perhaps you're in the fifth step of this wizard. You've been filling out different forms, answering different questions, and you suddenly realize, ah, you know, in the screen before this one, I answered something incorrectly. So your natural uh, instinct is to click on the back button so you can go back a step. But what can happen What's the challenge is that sometimes that back button won't work in the way that you expect. What it will do, in fact, is it will look at your history list. What was the last full, complete web page you went to? And it will go back to that previous page, which, in fact, may have been quite a while ago. That might have been something you were working on 20 minutes ago. So it j bypasses all the work that you were doing in this widget and jumps back all the way to the last complete rendered web page. Again, there are ways to get around this, um, but they are involved and require active attention. In addition, uh, testing and debugging applications can be tough. There are tools for debugging JavaScript, um, but they are tough to use and I'd say time consuming to use. So testing and debugging applications in JavaScript um, can be very, very problematic and challenging. So that gives us a basic understanding of the pros and cons of AJAX, how AJAX enables our web applications to be more dynamic, but some of the challenges that we face when coding AJAX by hand. In part two, we'll be uh, looking at the basics of GWT, and we'll see how GWT simplifies many of the challenges of AJAX while um, reaping all the benefits that AJAX has to offer. So this concludes part one of our introduction to GWT.